I was widowed three years ago. A suitable man to date has not yet fallen from the sky for me. And I wonder, should I continue to live my single life or dredge up more courage and optimism with the online dating game? This is episode number 611. I'm going to be coaching Catherine, who's a widow who wants another chance at love. She just lost her husband a few years ago. We're going to be talking to her. This is a one-time session. I have never met Catherine until today, and she is not a client. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Last First Date Radio, where we believe it is never too late to go on your last first date. I am Sandy Wiener. I'm a dating and relationship coach, and I have written two books to support you. The first one is called Becoming a Woman of Value, How to Thrive in Life and Love. And I coined the term woman of value because I realized that I had not valued myself most of my life before my divorce and before I became a dating coach. And I realized that the core of the work that I do is really helping people value themselves enough to attract the best of everything in their lives, not only relationships, but the best apartments and the best job and the best relationships with friends and family. So that book is going to help you with all of that. And the second book is called Choice Points in Dating. This book was published in 2023, and I wrote this book because so many people feel that they are not at choice when it comes to dating and relationships, that they're going to be dealt some kind of hand because of how they were brought up or their past relationships. And I'm here to tell you that it doesn't matter where you come from or what your background is, there's always a chance at growing and changing and having the life and the love that you want. Both books are available for Kindle or paperback on Amazon and Choice Points is now available as an audiobook as well. This week's tip on becoming a woman of value is step number 18, which is dare to think big. And I was just talking about how I didn't value myself. Well, thinking big was way out of my comfort zone and I had no idea how to do that. So I thought very small because if you think small, you won't get as hurt. But there is such value to thinking big, to having those dreams, to making those dreams come true, because if you can't dream it, you can't make it come true. So my challenge to you today is to think bigger about the things that you really want. And I'm sure we're going to talk about that today in the coaching session. Before I get to coaching Catherine, I wanted to invite you to join Your Last First Date. It is my Facebook group. It is free for women over 40, and even if you're close to 40, it's a place to come to be supported, to have a safe space. And because of that, we have strict guidelines. We have seven monitors. This is very unlike most of the groups out there. And I'm so proud of what we've created in the last five, six years. So join us at your last first date. And now I would like to welcome Catherine. Hi, Catherine. Hi. Thank you, Sandy. I'm a 62-year-old, and I was widowed three years ago. I am grateful to be retired, and I'm in excellent health, grateful every day. I was married to a wonderful man for 34 years, and we have four adult kids who are doing really well. I enjoy an active lifestyle, swimming, doing spinning classes, yoga, hiking, and gardening. I also work on ongoing art projects and I volunteer at the theater and at church and I help elderly residents and dogs in my neighborhood. While I have good girlfriends and I have male acquaintances, I yearn for a man to date. At times, I feel like a fifth wheel with my married friends if we are to go out. I crave a relationship with an honest man to share intimacy and enjoy this active and healthy chapter of our lives together. I also have the curse of being a retired nurse. I'm learning to stop being the caregiver after dating a man with significant anger issues and two men with drinking problems. A suitable man to date has not yet fallen from the sky for me. And I wonder, should I continue to live my single life or dredge up more courage and optimism with the online dating game? Thank you for sharing all of that, Catherine. First of all, I'm sorry for your loss. It's got to be devastating to be in a healthy marriage and suddenly be on your own and have lost such a, a good man. And it can be hard to find a not a replacement, but somebody who's going to be a good partner for you. And you have such a full life, which is awesome. I think a lot of people who 
go out there to date, they're, they're looking to have that missing piece because their lives are not fulfilling. So you have the yoga and the swimming and the spinning and the volunteer work and you have great friends. And then you mentioned that you were a nurse and I love how you call it a curse, the curse of the nurse, um, the nurse, the purse, the curse. Um, yeah. <laughs> I think that a lot of people who are nurses, they're caregivers, they are kind, they're people pleasers often, and they put other people's needs first. And because of that, you end up in relationships with people who are going to take advantage to uh, maybe they have more problems and you kind of maybe dismiss those issues until you're kind of all in. Uh, tell me a little bit about the two men that you dated. Let's start there. Yeah, I think you're accurate. And I, I must say, I've learned some things. I follow your um, podcast very regularly and also just reading and experiencing things. And I think I started with um, I learned from you uh, validation, just wanting validation. Can I, am I okay to date someone? You know, would someone find me suitable to date? And, and so I did overlook a lot. And the first man had never been married before. He um, coincidentally grew up right near where I did in the, in the Midwest. And we shared similar things that way. And even the street and I knew the home he grew up in and it was, you know, wow, this is an incredible coincidence. However, he had a very different family than I did growing up and had a lot of what I um, saw as unresolved anger with his siblings and also with his parents, things he didn't get. And so I really thought I was going to make this man's life better. And I, and I overlooked that for a while until I realized that it wasn't for me to I, I just didn't have enough <laughs> to give. And I had my own needs as we do as adults, um, having lived a large part of our life and the things that we experience in life. So I learned that how that actually ended was it just got so tense because I allowed, you know, he wanted to spend 24 seven with me. And I thought, gosh, this is kind of fun. And then I realized how tense it was making me and how much I was taking on the responsibility of trying to make things better for him. While it was attractive and I felt needed and the nurse in me and the caregiver and the mom and all of that was, I knew that role. I, you know, I don't, I didn't know the role of being a girlfriend. I didn't know what that was. I knew how to try and take care of someone. And then, so that's what I learned. And that's when I said, I can't do this anymore. Um, and it was not well received and it took a very long time. And it was a little bit, it was difficult for me to get over that relationship because it was six months or so. And that was the first one after mm. 35, 40 years. Yeah. So, so let me then, reflect on that for a moment. Okay. Uh, it's not uncommon, first of all, to just seek validation after loss or even after a divorce. You know, divorce is a, is a is a mourning of a relationship as well, and we often don't feel that we're going to be accepted by people that we date because, for whatever reason, we're older now, our bodies have changed. We haven't been with another person in a very long time. And so will somebody find me attractive? Will they like me? That's the first question that most people ask. Instead of as you grow and as you learn and as I coach people, it's will I also like them? Are they enough for me? Is this a good match? And so when the bar is lower and you're hoping to be liked, you often let in people who are not a good match in certain ways they might be, but the red flags are there. And so the anger issues are a victim mindset. It's somebody who can't regulate his emotions. It's somebody who is also clingy. He wanted you to be in his life all the time. He didn't have that full life probably that you have. And so there were some big takeaways from this. It's not my job to fix people, even though this is what I do for a living or did for a living. It's not my job in a relationship to be the caregiver or to fix somebody who has issues that they need to see a therapist for, and he's not. 
right? It's not our job. And it's, a, you know, it takes a while. I, I had issues with this too. I have to share that in the beginning, because I was a coach and I wanted to help people in the same way, I would listen to people tell me their stories that were all victim stories on a first phone call. I could stay on for an hour and a half wanting to hang up from the first 10 minutes, but listening to all the financial struggles that their ex-wife put them through. And, and I'm, and my kids aren't talking to me, you know, now they're red flags. I would hang up in five seconds, but then I felt uncomfortable hanging up. I thought it was mean. So my question is at the end, you said it took a while to end the relationship. Were you, were he pushed back? I'm, I'm imagining. Tell me what happened at the end. Yeah. He said, I'm not going to lose you. You know, I got things in the mail. I got things at my door. I knew the sound of his car. And I knew when he was, you know, in my driveway at my house. And so there was some, a little bit, a little bit of scary stuff, but also um, I felt badly and I might see him at church or, you know, I wondered how he was doing. I, his sister had become a friend of mine. I allowed that, you know, I, and not ever talking about this man, but that I would see how his sister was doing. And then I take some responsibility for sure, for not seeing and not being able to be as objective as I should have been. So um, now if I see this, this man, he, because we live a couple miles away, he won't even look at me. You know, it was very angry. And that even didn't feel good for a while. Like, really, you're in church and I say hello and you look the other way. But it's not mine. It's not mine to fix. I tried to communicate. I tried to dial it back. Let's just go to once a week. Let's go talk to someone. He had a real difficulty in wanting to talk to people, wasn't a lifelong learner, wasn't how can I make this better, which is really one of my values every day. You know, what can I do to improve? And and he, I mean, it was even, we were riding in a car and he's like, I'm going to take you home if you ask, if you talk about anything about our relationship, we're not going to talk about anything. You know, it was really had mm. some, some big walls. Yeah, he would not be happy that you're talking about him on the podcast, no, that's no. for sure. Okay. Uh, no and that's okay. He's not going to listen because he's not a lifelong learner. No. So we don't have to worry about that. But that sounds really hard. And I think that when we're concerned with how people take our feedback and they don't take it well and we feel responsible or we feel bad, it's also the growth. It's the getting away from any kind of codependent behavior where I feel responsible for you and your emotions. You know, you show up, you're kind, but boundaries are really important. And so it sounds like you needed to develop some clear boundaries and know your worth. That was the beginning stages of the dating. Yes. And, and the second one, I'll try and be a little shorter was um, someone that, you know, I'm, I'm active in swimming and I swim early in the morning with a master swim team. And this is someone from swimming. So, you know, you're in your bathing suit. There's no pretense. You dive in the water at 530 in the morning and get going. So that was someone that I met that way. And um, is also a really accomplished endurance athlete. And we shared a lot of those things. We love to cook together. And there was a lot of fun that was to be had but maybe a couple of months into the relationship I realized that and he had a drinking problem I don't know if I didn't see it or I didn't want to see it also someone who was never married and um, kind-hearted person but didn't see themselves had a lot of things that they were dealing with with their again with their parents a divorce with his parents. And again, um, just not a great relationship, you know, with his father and other things that I tried to help with. And then I, when I, when I realized the day I realized that there was a drinking issue, I said, I'm not able to continue this relationship. I wish the best for you. I think you're a wonderful, awesome person, but I think you need to get you know, there's, there's a, there's a big issue. And, and he said, what are you talking about? And I said, I think, you know, what I'm talking about. He said, you're right. And that was it. And I still see him a year later. I still see him in the morning and we wave and say hello. And I stay within my boundaries, I guess is the best way to say it. 
Yeah. I mean, that one sounds like it ended with more clarity and more kindness and he didn't push back and try to win you over and they get mad at you for not wanting to be with him anymore. He, he heard no. And that's, that's a big step towards the right direction. Right. Right. So you met these two men organically and Mm -hmm. not online. Have you ever tried online dating? I have. And I have, and, and what I've learned again, I will have coffee with someone. I will. And, and I'm, I'm more upfront about what I, what I'm looking for and who I am and what my values are and trying to let the other stuff fall away, not even trying to let it, the curse of the nurse is I'm trying to really look at that and be objective as, as best I can. And I fill journals and I, I, I overthink things too. You know, you might have picked that up, but in any case, so yes, I have. And I've gone, I've never, I don't think gone on more than one or two dates, really. Um, there was actually, no, there is someone else that I dated longer and that situation was someone who was working full time. I'm retired and was working full time and really wanted someone that would help take care of them. And I was more than willing to have dinner ready and plan things for us to do. And we enjoyed um, we enjoyed spending time together, certainly going to concerts and doing lots of things that there are, you know, there's lots to do in South Florida. But um, at one point, the person said to me, you know, I think this is my last first date. And I I think I'd like to move in, you know, with something about, and I, I, I had to really put the brakes on because I felt like I was being taken advantage of. And I, while I like this person, I, um, I think they needed too much from me monetarily and emotionally and just, Um, I planned things and I had dinner ready and I was a caretaker. So you're still stuck in this pattern of caretaking, even though you're trying to vet people and say, here are my values, which um, is common. Like we need to really unravel what are the must haves and what are the deal breakers. So we know what you are sharing up front and what you're not addressing early enough, because it sounds Mm -hmm. like it takes a, a while until you see this is a true deal breaker for me, I need to get out. Right, right. So people don't take advantage of you unless you let them. (laughs) Right, I'm sure you know that. Well, no, and I I think in terms of attachment and some of the other things I've been learning that I never really paid attention to because I was so entrenched with four children and a really busy life and I worked in pediatric oncology. I I gave a lot. I lost my mother when I was young. You know, I have two immigrant parents. I I am probably, you know, I I am. (laughs) I like to be needed. I like to do well and care for people. That's important to me on a spiritual, religious basis and also for my own needs. Dating actually is like the best school of personal development when you use it that way, because all of our wounds come out, all of our past, all of our attachment issues, we can be really successful as a parent, as a wife, as a, you know, as, as an employee, as a nurse, but when it comes to getting back out there again and realizing, Hey, there are patterns that are showing up and they're linked to my past. They're linked to my lifestyle before, and now I want a different outcome. And so if you are constantly overgiving, overdoing, even when you're pulling back, you're still overgiving and overdoing, you're still feeling responsible for other people first. You know, there's a lot of the, I need to take care of you and sure, I'll, I'll cook that, I'll do that, right? So we wanna get you to recognize these things sooner and it doesn't mean ending the relationship sooner necessarily. It could also mean negotiating differences early on like saying, hey, I really like you. I don't enjoy planning all the time. I'm exhausted. I, you know, I have a busy life. I love creating, co-creating a, a true partnership with somebody. And what that looks like to me is fill in the blank. So let's talk about what that looks like to you. What would partnership look like? Why don't we spend some time together? I'm a planner, you know, clearly, but why don't we spend some time together next weekend? What 
what would be enjoy, you know, this would be enjoyable for me. What would be enjoyable for you? Why don't you surprise me with something that you think we'd like to do together? So that's part of it is you want to have the discussion and then also have the person that you're seeing plan things you like when they surprise you and plan things, but you are also giving them a clue. You're not just like pull this out of a hat and they're going to be like planning, uh, going to a, a tr trampoline park and you don't like trampolines, right? <laughs> or you have a broken ankle. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, giving people like, Hey, this is, these are the things that make me happy. So mm -hmm. in my coaching practice, I have something called the operator ma operating manual. And I've talked about it a little bit on the podcast before. Basically, it, it's divided into three key areas of attraction in relationships. The physical, so these are lifestyle, the lifestyle that we live, the physical, the personality, the temperament. Who are we? What do we, what do we eat? How, when do we go to sleep? What are our practices around meditation? Whatever it is that makes us happy. Act, active lifestyle, all the things that you're talking about. Those are things that are necessary for us to operate well. And often when we're in relationship, we start to give up some of those things in the beginning. Oh, well, I had an exercise class and I didn't take it because I was meeting you for coffee and I was too shy to tell you that I would like to meet you later and I don't mm -hmm. want to be difficult, right? So this mm -hmm. is where we start to lose ourselves. Right. Then we have the spiritual realm. We have like, what are our spiritual practices? Do we believe in God? Do we, do we go to church, synagogue? Are we atheists? Do we believe in miracles, faith? All of these things are part of our spiritual life, but it also leads to our worldview, how we see the world. And sure. so you mentioned lifelong learner. You mentioned you're always growing and learning. And if you're with somebody who's not, that's, that's something you want to know up front because you're going to share those parts with you. So just mm -hmm. the logistics of let's spend time together on the weekend. Here's what I like. What do you like? That's good communication. Mm -hmm. Right. And you like surprises. What else do you need to have in a partner? Like what are some of the qualities in your husband that really made you love him? Your question is what are, what were the qualities with just how much we cared for each other and how we took care of each other. And so I think my first year was difficult because I was white knuckling it. How am I going to, I relied on this person. How am I going to be able to manage all the things we manage in life by myself? So Michael took great care of me. Um, he, uh, he was just a very loving kind of self deprecating. He was an attorney, but he, he was just very kind. Kindness was probably his number one attribute, just a very loving, kind man. He, you know, he put others before himself and I think he spoiled me. <laughs> I will never replace him. My needs are very different now, mm -hmm. but some of those qualities of being very kind and very honest, I, um, I value experiences. I value people. Both of us did over material things. We have a nice quality of life, but that isn't what fuels me. It's, I've traveled quite a bit. Um, and I have a lot, you know, we have had a lot of friends and we were very involved in our community. Those are important values that he and I both shared. You both valued people and experiences over material things. You had a lot of friends. So it sounds like socializing is important sharing friends is important community involvement is important somebody who doesn't value material things as much as experiences and travel and all those kinds of things that you did together we are very very involved with our families you dated two men who had family issues you dated two men who really hadn't done the work and were unaware of the issues that they had. And so these are really against the core values of your marriage and who you became in this marriage. Yes. So you can see clearly there were big things that were missing. Mm -hmm. So partnership for you, it sounds like maybe there are some new things and we'll talk about those, but it involves caring for each other, really valuing each other, being kind to each other. Those are a given. And then, um, somebody who 
is not materialistic. Somebody who is who values the experiences that you do and has his own and somebody who's also social. You know, I've talked to men who say social life is really important to them. I was married to somebody who was fairly antisocial and that was not good for our marriage. It was not good for me. He, mm-hmm. he kind of didn't really have friends and I had great friends. And so I want at this part of my life, I want to be with somebody who has good friends too. Because it says a lot about a person when they nurture relationships with friends, they also nurture, usually nurture relationships in their romantic life. Mm -hmm. So community, family, you want to know that he has a good relationship with family. There are many people out there who are not speaking to family members and it's not always a problem. So in those cases, there are some families that are really toxic and leaving those families is actually healthy. But you want to get curious about what's going on. If you meet another man who says he's he's got this terrible relationship with his children or his parents, you want to get curious. Tell me a little bit more without fixing, Mm -hmm. (laughs) without being his therapist. You want to find out who is this person. Mm -hmm. So on top of these qualities, what is different this time around that you're looking for? Let's take a quick break to hear from our sponsors. This episode is brought to you by Amazon Music Unlimited. You can listen to over 70 million songs and thousands of playlists and stations. Plus, you can now stream your favorite podcasts like Last First Date Radio. You can listen to any song, anytime, anywhere, on any of your devices. Get Amazon Music Unlimited for free for 30 days. Just head on over to getamazonmusic.com forward slash last first date to learn more and claim this offer. What am I looking for that's different this time? It's really to enjoy every day. And I think what I learned in caring for my husband for four years was that every day is precious. And that's where I have a little bit of a hard time is that I have this kind of sense of urgency. I'm healthy. You know, I, I don't, there isn't a day that goes by that I don't take my health for granted because I've seen it in my work and I've seen it with my own husband, how, how much he suffered. I feel like, wow, now's the time if I want to date someone and, and while I'm well and not have to care for someone, that's part of it. You know, as we, as we are committed to each other, you take whatever, you know, whatever happens that day, you know, I'm a kind of all in person, not that I want to be married. I don't think I do, but just in terms of if I'm committed to someone, it's going to be okay. How can I help you? I'm not going to hit the road if something were to go wrong and it, and it will, our health isn't mm-hmm. over. I know that. So, um, but it takes a lot of work <laughs> and maybe that's what I'm, that's maybe what I'm wrestling with too. Just live out my life and be grateful. And I used to be very lonely and I I've gotten much better at being alone with myself. That's good. And that's a good place to date from uh-huh. because what you want is somebody who's going to add value to your life and not, not be a burden. You realize that life is precious and that, Mm -hmm. that every day is a gift and that we don't have any guarantees in terms of health, but we do have some information that we get early on about a person that tells us if we want to invest in getting to know them better, we want to give of ourselves to this person And you mentioned that in the beginning, you will share your values to the men you date. Tell me how that might sound. How does that look when I am kind of showing my values? This is how I like to enjoy time. This is what's important to me. This is how I spend my time. This is what I'm invested in. And does that match or not? And how Mm -hmm. they, you know, tell me about your day. How did you spend your day today? You know, those kinds of things when I'm getting to know someone. And do you find out a lot about a person that way? Well, I think so. I think that, you know, you can tell what, you know, what's important to them and where are they giving their time and resources. Mm -hmm. What I'm not good at is asking more pointed questions. And, and uh, initially, in those first few, in those first few relationships, I just went with it. You know, I just was enjoying the attention and, you know, as you talked about, but now 
I am starting to, you know, tell me more about that or trying to size things up in a little quicker fashion. Telling them how you enjoy your time and what's important to you and then asking if it aligns, that's a kind of a leading question. Okay. That could get a guy to go, yeah, that's good for me too, right? It may not get you the same kind of answer as if you ask them without sharing so much first. That question about how do you spend your free time? You know, what do you do? What, what was the best part of your day so far? How do you spend your free time? What um, is there? Do you give back in any way? So volunteering is important to you. Do you give back in any way? And then you're finding out not just does it align with you, like you can share, I volunteer, I love volunteering to do this. And I love it because mm -hmm. the because part is really important. And then you ask them, so, you know, is there anything that you do to give back? And they go, yeah, no, not really. You know, I used to give to a charity or, you know, whatever. Um, I've gone to a soup kitchen to help out once on Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. And then you could get curious about that. So what was the best part of that for you? What did you enjoy about that? Because that's something you'd like to do again. I'm looking to do something like that with a partner. Mm -hmm. And you can ask them questions about how they see partnership in their lives. Like what do, what do they see if they were in a partnership, how would it fit into their lives? Because you would have heard from the guy who wanted to cling to you and never leave you. Oh, we'd be together 24 seven. We'd move in together. Mm -hmm. I would live, eat and breathe you. And you would say, goodbye. That's nice. That's not what I'm looking for. And so you can get some more information by asking more pointed questions um, and not sharing so much of your life up front. So they just go, sure. Yeah, that's that's important to me, too. Because it's easy to lie about that. Yeah. You want the details. Yeah. So the more you know about these non-negotiables, you know, um, somebody who's social, somebody who's, so let's, let's kind of list them. We kind of, we talked about them sort of in a scenario, but we want to get down to the nitty gritty because what's happened before is you overlooked red flags and we want to get to the red flags and the green flags. So the green flags are, We'll list five of them. Give me, give me five things that you absolutely must have. Someone who values relationships with their family and close friends. Okay. Or a social might be a thing. Someone who values their health and, you know, takes care of their health as much as they can in terms of their diet and their exercise and not abusing their bodies. That's important to me. Mm-hmm. Um, someone who volunteers and gives back in their community. Someone who is kind and compassionate to others that they meet. And a fifth one, someone who enjoys learning new experiences of music and lectures and documentaries and theater. Okay, wants, so to, culture. wants to have, yes, cultural awareness. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So values relationship with family and close friends, values their health through diet and exercise, volunteers and gives back, kind and compassionate to others and enjoys learning and new experiences. Right. And let's talk about some red flags. So I listed poor family relationships, not a lifelong learner slash rigid thinker, like somebody who's really not open-minded. Mm -hmm. um, I just extrapolated that from what you shared before. What else is a red flag to you? Um, I don't know. You know, I, I feel like we think politics are um, taboo, but it's a value of mine. Um, both my parents were immigrants and I see this country as being, um, that's one of the best things of this country. So I guess I would say, um, an openness or a tolerance for others that are different than us and realizing mm -hmm. the value of that in our country. So that's a green flag, open-minded. Well, or yeah, I could say, I guess the red flag would be someone who's rigid in their thinking or their political views. 
Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? I'm I'm in South Florida. I it's the challenge. Can I say that? <laughs> Am I giving yeah. away too much? <laughs> no, I mean, look, politics are a hot point for a lot of people, but to me, it's about values. Right. We're not really talking about candidates. We're talking about our belief system. And if you're telling me that I'm wrong and bad for voting for somebody, I don't really want to be in a relationship with you because we're not having a conversation. We're having a right or wrong thinking conversation and that's not open. So we don't have to necessarily agree on the candidate, but we have to agree on the issues that are important. Right. Why? Why? What are you yep, interested always in? The why. How are, yeah, exactly. I agree with you. You're mm -hmm. right. We're trying so, to build, yeah, consensus and understanding. Yeah. And that's that's where people grow together. And so you mentioned also that somebody who doesn't value, somebody who values health is important. So that somebody who doesn't value their health would be a deal breaker, right? Right. Like a, a smoker, a, you know, an excessive drinker, mm -hmm. I'm, you know, illicit drugs, not, I'm not interested. Okay. I wanted to talk about the... Um, the way the first guy couldn't resolve conflict, that he had to have his way or the highway. So he was a, I would say, um, a poor communicator. He was a um, conflict averse. Yes. Um, so something like that, I think would be a big deal breaker for you. Would you say someone, I mean, I don't know, this is overused, but um, someone who isn't able to be vulnerable. Sometimes I can, I could give you a laundry list of all my faults, you know, some I've had to work at, my daughter will say to me, don't talk about my mom that way. You know, I, I, um, I can be self-critical for sure. Mm -hmm. And that's from my upbringing. That's from really hard driving, successful parent, immigrant mm -hmm. parent. And I, I'm aware of it, but, and I'm working on it. Well, I mean, awareness is key. And so somebody yeah. who's not aware is right. also a problem. And that was an issue with both men that you dated. Right. So um, open-minded and self-aware, I would say, mm -hmm. are important mm -hmm. qualities. And then can't be vulnerable, lack of self-awareness. So with this new list, you can go back out there and date, date online, which will give you many more options and date offline too. You're in a, in a place where there's a lot of outdoor activities. There are a lot of things. You do a lot of volunteer work. You probably come into contact with a lot of people that you may not even consider as dates because you may have day-to-day -day kind of conversations with them. But what if you went a little deeper with people in all aspects of your life and found out the why? Tell them, you know, really find out from everybody. So you start having these kinds of conversations, not just with dates, but with everyone. Mm -hmm. How would that, how would that look? I think that's key. I think that's really needed. That's going to be the first part of your homework is to go out and have more deep conversations, um, more interesting conversations that get to the, the next layer with every, I would say every man in your life. <laughs> <laughs> I would say with everyone, but with especially. Everyone, right? Yeah. Friends too. Yeah, no, because it, it needs to be a practice skill. Yeah. And then when you're on dates to keep these five green flags, five red flags in mind and ask questions that lead to them sharing more and you sharing less upfront. Yes. And you know, you just had a, you had a wonderful person on earlier this week. And one of the things they made me realize I'm the youngest of five. Attention is important to me. Not only did my husband spoil me, but my father, my mother, and my older siblings. And so I think I, my dad had a saying for me that um, you have two ears and one mouth. You should listen twice as much as you speak. And if I ever had a tattoo, that might be the tattoo that I have. But you're right. I, I'm kind of wanting to get my, you know, wanting to get my word in. And I would do so much better if I listened more and I would understand more. Yeah. And then there'll be the men who will want to talk the entire time. And that's not OK either. So, yes, uh -huh. on the one mouth and two ears. And also, it should be an even exchange. You know, I think women who listen well tend to get lost in the mix too. And so you want to be able to assert yourself, to 
make sure that you're heard and that you become memorable to this person because of what you're sharing. But it's not over talking. It's sharing the right kind of information because we're really just trying to make connections and see what we have in common. And doing this work for 16 years, I will tell you that most of us have more in common than we think. And whenever I lead a group and I have a coaching course, I started a new one last night on communication skills. And all the women in the group are like, wow, we all come from different backgrounds, but we have so many similarities. And so we want to do that on dates too. And the reason that comes out in a group that I lead is because we go deep. We find out about our past and our family relationships and what was what, what are the key skills that we need to work on. So you have all this awareness, you have so much to give. And I think with just a few little tweaks, you can just have better experiences on dates. You'll enjoy yourself more and not feel like either I live a life that's single or I go back out and get into the drudgery of dating. <laughs> it's not the either or, right? And you know, one other thing I think I learned from you is that just be in the present, right? We know that through yoga, but we know that in lots of ways, but it's very important here to not try and forecast. Could this be something? No, this is only the coffee today. Like mm -hmm. I've had to be real intentional about that, not trying to think ahead. I don't know. I'm, I'm investigating. I'm just learning. Slow yeah. down. You know? Yeah, that's so important. I love that you brought that up. Being present, just having an experience. I like to take the word dating and throw it out, actually, and just yeah. say having experiences because it's about connection. We're all looking for connection and we can all learn from each other. We can all give each other little gifts, you know, and if you make the most of it and don't go into the date feeling like, well, if it isn't the best match in the world, it's a waste of my time. I don't think anything's a waste of your time. You know, if you get onto a date and you realize it's not a good match, you can leave in 10 minutes. I've done that. <laughs> I ended a phone call in 10 minutes because it was so clear we were a terrible match. And, but that comes with clarity and self-knowing. And so the more you know about yourself, the more you express who who it is that you are best aligned with who you are at your core and you learn about them and then the dating process is where you get to see these things in action is it true is it true that they really volunteer when they said they did is it true that he is open-minded when you're having conversations where he seems like he's not and so that's that's where the rubber meets the road but you're just trying to sprinkle these little things in from the beginning to see are we both looking for the same kinds of things or do we value the same things? Mm -hmm. Okay. This has been very helpful. Thank you so very much, Sandy. Oh, I appreciate it very much. Yeah. My pleasure. So I'm going to give you this homework and okay. I would love for you to get back to me and let me know how it goes. So your, your homework is to have more deep conversations with everyone and to keep those red and green flags in mind when you go on dates, ask questions that help you move the needle further, help you to figure out if they're gonna be a good match and be present. Be present to the person in front of you, not whether they're gonna be your life partner, but am I gonna have fun? Yes. Am, I, am I enjoying this person's company? Do I wanna see them again? That's all you need to know. Yeah, thank you. Thank you okay. so very much. Appreciate all your patience and all your wisdom. Oh, really. Thank you. thank you. Well, I think you're wonderful. And I look forward to hearing about your next act. <laughs> well, thanks everybody for listening. If you love our show, please give us a high rating on Apple podcast or wherever you listen to podcasts. And as always, here's to your last first date. If you are ready to get unstuck, gain new tools, become more empowered and finally find your last first date, I'd love to talk to you. Fill out an application to be considered for a complimentary half hour love breakthrough session at lastfirstdate.com forward slash application.